do it, but shit. Oh my god. We are, for the most part, complete with weather theory. The uh, how does high pressure work? How does low pressure work? Well, because we've got circulation patterns. The circulation patterns are all regarding heat transfer, okay? And I know that I can describe on a map, on a chart, which way the winds are flowing around these things because of Coriolis. And I know depending on how close or far apart those isobars are spread, that describes the relative speed of these winds. Then I got a little bit of idea of some local patterns, and that's all I need for this weather theory. Next thing we talk about are some actual weather patterns. How do I, how, how can I predict certain things? Armed with the information I know right now, which I, I get it. It's, it, it doesn't seem like a whole lot, but just armed with what you have right now, we can begin to form some opinions and have some uh, characteristics of normal weather phenomena. All right. Any, any questions at all? And I'd like to, if you guys are okay with it, just jump straight into this. All right. Yes, sir. A hundred percent. They're parallel. They're parallel to the isobars. That is 100% correct. If I look at one of those charts, the one with the, all the lines and everything and the high pressure and low pressure, my upper level winds are exactly parallel to those isobars, okay? That's a fantastic question. Remember that stuff, because that stuff is what's gonna help you go through these decisions very rapidly. Remember, pilot and command, and we're gonna talk again about pilot and command, surprise, okay? Pilot and command, this person needs to make decisions, because they have the responsibility and the authority. And it's limitless. That is your machine, okay? So these people have to make the decisions, okay? What else? What else we got? Something out there? No, nothing? Wow. All right. All right. Are you guys okay? Anybody need a bathroom break or caffeine or chocolate? Oof, man. I just had, I got to share with you guys. I had probably one of the best meals I had in my life today. I, I'm sure I can't tell my wife that because, well, I don't know if she'd even care. It, I don't even know. I got to show you guys the picture of the, I took a picture of the outside of the place, but it was at the uh, uh, exhibition for national. Okay, that. Okay. And that sounds familiar. But anyways, there was a, a little place back by the, of course, by the spaceship, because that's where I needed to go back there by the fighter jet and the helicopter that where I wanted to go right away. Right. So back there, there was a little place kind of off behind everything else. And I had, uh, it was like a barbecue, I guess they called it, but it was open fire, uh, open flame uh, meat. And it had pork and it was on kebabs and I had borscht and vegetables and good Lord have mercy. I sat there and I thought I've found heaven is right here inside this place. And they had some black tea with, oh, I, I will have dreams about that place. So anyways, <laughs> does anybody need a bathroom break or coffee or tea or chocolate or something like that? No, okay. You good? You, yeah, absolutely. Grab some water. We need, we need to arm up. Remember, I'm safe checklist. And I, I talk to pilots about this all the time too. I'm safe. Let's review real quick. What is that? That's the pilot assessment, right? What is, what's the I? Am I sick? Okay, what's the M? Am I on any kind of meds? Okay. Okay. What's the S? And remind me, because sometimes I can't spell well. You guys had me scared. What's the S? Okay. <laughs> Can we laugh about that one for a moment? Okay. There's a little bit of stress with everybody, but is it an acceptable level of stress, right? Okay. A, what's the A? Alcohol. All right. And we're going to go into something interesting about alcohol today. I got to, I got to drop some bombs on you today about alcohol. Okay. Uh, what's the F? Fatigue, yeah, and the E? Emotions, it is eating. You're right, they do put emotions in there. Okay, eating, yeah, 
Don't be that pilot. I, I've flown with pilots before. They come to Florida. They've been flying for the last five days. They've got exactly six days remaining before they have to leave and go back to wherever in the world they came from, right? And they've been flying for five days, twice a day, taking ground school, everything else. Today is my day. They've been flying for five days every day, twice a day, right? They've been taking ground class. They've been taking everything. I get with this pilot and I'm talking from 17 years old to 70 from people all over. When I say all over the world, I mean literally all over the world. And I get this pilot and they get in the airplane. I don't even think they know their own name, much less mine or what they're going to do with this airplane. When's the last time you ate anything? Huh? Yeah, you know, you, you got to eat something, okay? Yeah, I know we're all adults here. I get it. But make sure you eat, make sure you drink water, okay? Weather patterns. Wait until you see this list. You're welcome. All right. Okay. Believe it or not, these are some of my favorite things to talk about. But I'm also going to say that about every subject. So I guess they're all my favorites. All right. We just got the key terms and that's it. Everybody's good. We're starting off. Take a look at this list. We got a bunch of them up there, right? Stability. Ah, uh, uh, all right. Important. Right, hold on with me with the stability. I need to make sure everybody focus. That, that's kind of my, the earth is not moving one, okay? Adiabatic heating, adiabatic cooling. We already touched it a little bit, right? Lapse rate. We already know lapse rate. So might tell me, describe to me lapse rate just real quick. How many degrees Celsius per thousand feet as I climb? Two. Yep. That three was the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So there's different lapse rates. All right. That's, that was my whole point with doing that. Make sure I know the lapse rate that we're talking about. All right. We will come back. This is just a review. Okay. Temperature inversion. I think we talked about that. What happens with the temperature inversion? It will happen there. It'll happen during stable conditions. We're going to add that to our little tool bag too today. What else? What happens with the temperature inversion? It goes upside down, right? Inverted. So instead of getting cooler as I climb through it, it gets warmer as I climb through it. Temperature inversion. All right. Okay. We're going to start going through here. Evaporation, condensation, sublimation, deposition. How water or moisture will change states. Okay. Melting, freezing, humidity, relative humidity. Uh, that one's kind of easy. Dew point saturated, dew frost, condensation, nuclei. Temperature dew point spread. A bunch of different clouds. A bunch of different fogs. We're going to go through each one. A bunch of different clouds. One type of cloud that could become embedded. Before I go any further with embedded or any further even down this list. What in the love of holy is embedded. What does that mean? One inside the other. Yes. One inside the other. I, I couldn't have probably said it better myself. Okay. Something that I cannot see because it's contained in something else. Okay. Particularly thunderstorms. I can't see it. So it doesn't look like it's in there. But if I were to start getting inside this thing, it can cause a lot of damage to my airplane. Okay. So one more, please just by, and this one, raise your hands. I want to pick somebody. Can I fly my airplane in a cloud? All right. So nobody raise their hands, but you're right. Everybody knows that we're not going to fly in any kind of cloud. So embedded thunderstorm at this point is just, it's just a, a academic test. That's all it is. Do I know what this means? It won't affect me at all until I go instruments and it becomes a big deal. Okay. So another one, we're just planting seeds. Precipitation. What does that mean? We got plenty of it down there. Super cooled water droplets. Those are some of the, some or another one of the most hazardous weather phenomena. Okay. Doesn't seem like it. It seems super. Right? Like, that sounds great. All right. Virga. This is water coming out of a cloud, but it doesn't reach the ground. So Virga. 
Precipitation induced fog. Like I said, we had a bunch of different fogs. We're going to go through them. Ice pellets, hail, fall streaks, air mass. Well, all of this is some sort of precipitation. Goes right back up precipitation. Air mass. And these are large, large regions of air moving along. Source region, where did it come from in the first place? Areas in between those air masses, which are called fronts. Different types of fronts. Okay? So just to drop all these on you at once and say, hey, look, at the end of the section, we're all going to talk smart about each one of these terms. Okay? All of these, for instance, are all related. Bunch of fogs, bunch of clouds, right? Bunch of, all oh, bunch of different clouds. So it's not as daunting as what it looks like. All right, stability. Remember I said, this is my one. If, you, if you're not okay with stability, by the time I get done the next little couple minutes, tell me. Don't, don't make me guess, because you gotta know stability. A lot of things are going to depend on stability. This is your critical key task here is no stability. Okay. As long as a parcel of air remains unsaturated. Wow, geez, they haven't told me what saturated means yet. And all of a sudden they're telling me this. Okay. In other words, as long as I have air that is not a cloud or fog. Okay. I have air in this room. Is there any moisture at all in this air? Yeah, there's some. How do I know that for sure? Well, because I, 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 some of this stuff is, you gotta prove it to me. Okay, fine, I can prove it to you. We're gonna take my Coke and we're gonna put it over there in the refrigerator and leave it overnight. And inside the refrigerator, not in the freezer, make a mess, okay? So it's in the refrigerator, and then tomorrow I set it on that table. What do I find on the outside of that can? Yeah, a bunch of moisture. Where in the world did that come from? Is a can open? Is a can leaking or something? No, right? So I have saturation inside this air. And in most cases, I have saturation in all air, okay? But as long as the air is unsaturated, it's not a cloud or it's not fog, it will expand and cool at a rate of three degrees per thousand feet. Already, you guys are shaking your fist at You said two. I know this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. All right. As the air descends, it will compress and warm at the same rate. So where does this two and three come about? Well, uh, that's military, right? The, what the flight instructor, you guys hear. Remember what the flight instructor is going to tell you if he doesn't know the answer? It's all military. No, it's not military. This is air rising in an expanse. This is not me flying this sorry machine and climbing. That's when I see two degrees per, cell, per uh, thousand feet, okay? If I'm on the ground here and it's exactly 26 degrees Celsius and I can climb up 4,000 feet, we all did this exercise two days ago, I go up 4,000 feet, well, it's eight degrees Celsius less. So it's 18, it's kind of chilly, right? Okay, why does that happen? Just say it's magic, okay? I don't know. But I can tell you that for air moving upwards, it's expanding. And as that air expands, it's cooling at a rate of three degrees per thousand feet. So this is not you and I taking a climb, a rapid climb through the air. This is a piece of air deliberately moving up. All right, everybody okay with this? All right, okay. Well, they're both for real. Two degrees is what I'm gonna see. You guys know that we have air temperature gauges on the airplanes? Okay. So if, if you didn't, a lot, of, a lot of people in here know a lot already about airplanes, and I sincerely appreciate it. Whether you read it, saw it on YouTube, or whatever you did, this is awesome, okay? But we have air uh, temperature indicators on these airplanes. And if I, ha if I look at my air temperature indicator and I climb, I go up however many thousand feet, I'm going to see about two, and it's not always, okay? but I'm gonna see about two degrees per thousand feet decrease on the Celsius scale, okay? 
That's me climbing through the air. The air is not moving up. If the air is moving upwards, it's not moving as fast as we are, okay? This, this is real as well. Both of these things are real, but this is air, and that's why it's stability, like I said in the beginning, this is the one that's tough, okay? I've tried to describe it a bunch of different ways. This is air moving upwards. Why is it moving upwards? It could be anything. It could be moving up a slope like we had with Mount Everest up there. It was moving up. It could be moving up because there's a, there's a front and it's moving up as that front moves through. It could be moving up because it's heated from below and it's moving up like that from convection. <coughs> there's a lot of different reasons why it moves up, but as it moves up, it expands and then it cools at three degrees per, per thousand feet, okay? All right, same thing going down. And this is only unsaturated air. Okay, visibility is often very poor in a temperature inversion. Well, that's nice to know. Where in the world did that come from? Because we talked about a temperature inversion at the very beginning. We said, what in the world does that mean? Temperatures upside down? I don't understand that. Well, that means as I climb now, the temperature of the air is going to get warmer. This will occur. Almost every single one, here I go with almost again. Every single one of these things that I've put up here have said normally, almost, in most cases. So it's, it, that is theory. Now we're getting a little closer to real and what we'll expect to find in the atmosphere. I know that sometimes the theory is exactly opposite. Sometimes it's exactly backwards, okay? All right, so here I have a temperature inversion and the, the visibility is very poor. I can't see very far. You can see it's like I got clouds or very low, very low clouds or fog right here at the surface. That will usually indicate that I have stable conditions. It'll also usually indicate that I have a temperature inversion, okay? Okay, how did all that moisture get there anyways? By the way, this air, is that saturated or unsaturated air? Saturated. Is everybody okay with that? That is saturated air. I have moisture in this room right now, but we're not saturated. If we were saturated, it would be fog. It would be difficult for me to see the back of the room, okay? All right, here we go with the moisture content now. That top part, latent heat absorbed, latent heat released. If you're doing chemistry, I probably want to apply the latent heat of evaporation, latent heat of uh, melting, or whatever the case may be. We're not doing chemistry. It's there. That's fine. It's not going to affect me at all. Okay? Not in an appreciable sense for me studying weather right now. But... <clears throat> Water vapor will change states. Great, we know that. Easy, easy stuff. Ice, water, some sort of vapor. Like what we have right in here, there's water vapor. Do I see it? No, because it's not saturated. If I put my Coke can out there and I get that water all the way around it, well, that's because the air, right? The moisture inside the air surrounding that bottle reach the dew point, we're going to spend more time on dew point, and it condensated, right? I have condensation now on the outside of that. If I made the temperature in this room below freezing, I could have ice. All that is is a change in state. Easy, easy, easy stuff, right? And then as ice melts, it turns back into water. And then as water evaporates, if I had a a ring of water on here for my Coke yesterday, and I come back and that ring of water's not gone. Did, did, did a goblin come in here and drink that water? No, it just evaporated, right? It evaporated, it went back into the air. I know these are very simple things, but when we start talking about clouds and how they're formed and as temperatures decrease and we go up and things become cold and they freeze, all of this stuff begins to become more and more important, okay? All right, <clears throat> let's start talking a little bit about humidity, relative humidity. You got a desert and you got some sort of snow land, okay? 32 degrees Celsius is the temperature. 
10 degrees Celsius is the dew point. You have 26% 20 relative humidity. How did they come up with that 26%? I honestly, I don't care. It doesn't matter. The only thing I'm concerned about as an aviator is it's not 100. If it's not 100, I am fine and happy. Okay, I'm fine and happy if it's 100 as also. There's no doubt about it. But this starts changing a lot of things for me. Okay, so that means that I have some humidity, but I don't have saturated air. Here, the temperature is minus five. The dew point is minus five. We have exactly 100% relative humidity. <sighs> All right, couple things on this slide. We gotta park here for a minute and take a, a little sightseeing tour. Couple things on this slide. Temperature is temperature. Easy stuff, just how in the world do I, you know, how many molecules are moving, how fast are they moving, how much mercury goes up and down the scale, what does it feel like, am I wearing a jacket and hat and gloves and scarf, and Lord knows I had put on a lot of clothes here, right? But dew point, th this doesn't make sense to me. I can't comprehend that. And additionally, I really have nothing. I mean, we got phones and all kind of crap. Everybody look at your phone, you can see what the temperature is, right? That's easy. Anybody got dew point on their phone? Probably not. I mean, you can find it. You go in there and get to a weather app and you find dew point. We don't know what to do with it when we get it, right? So what in the world is this dew point? Let me explain it for a moment. On this slide, I got a hot area and a cold area. Let's talk for a little bit. In that advisory circular that I told you about, advisory circular 00-6B, there is a great couple of slides, couple of pictures about relative humidity and changes in water capacity based on temperature. I had those slides in, in this presentation for a lot of years. But unfortunately, once I got to that slide, I had a lot of people just click right off on me. So I'm gonna talk it through and really, I think this is gonna be better. Okay, the last couple of times that I've talked it through, it's been better. So I have a hot area and I have a cold area. Let's talk real quick, what's going on with the molecules? I'm in the hot area. If I had a parcel of air, does parcel make sense to everyone? Most, most classes it doesn't, especially, I think America keeps getting dumber and dumber. I don't know why, that's a true story. Right? But nobody knows what in the world parcel is, but just like a little box, except I don't have a box, okay? So just a little block of air here that I'm holding. And if I'm holding this box of air, this parcel of air, and it's very, very warm, what's happening with the air molecules? They're moving faster. If they're moving faster, do we, we got bumper cars? You guys have bumper cars? A little museum ride, right? or not museum ride, but amusement park ride, okay. These, these things all bump into each other and they all go different places and all that other stuff. There's fewer air molecules here than I have in the same little parcel of air here, okay? There's a lot fewer of them over there in the same block of air. Because here, what's happening with these air molecules? They're not moving as fast. They're not bumping off to each other as fast. So there's room for more of them. They're closer together. There's room for me to have more. All right, so my little box of air right here, it actually weighs more. We talked about that. That was fun. And this one weighs less. Okay. Which box of air has more room for moisture? Yeah, is everybody okay with that? Because here I have air molecules bouncing off of each other and moving really fast. So I have fewer air molecules here. That gives me more room for other things like water, okay? Here, they're moving very, very slow. They're already, moved, they already filled this entire box up. The box is already heavier. I don't have as much room for, air mole or for water molecules, right? I just don't. So I can contain more moisture 
in a warm environment. There's more capacity, right? I can put more moisture in warm air, okay? All right, so that's the first little tour. The second tour is, hey, let's talk dew point again. If I add more moisture to this air, I'm increasing the dew point. Because once the dew point reaches the temperature, that's when you're at 100% saturation. Take a look. Temperature and dew point are right there on each other, 100%. So if I'm adding more moisture to this thing, I'm increasing the percentage of moisture that's in there as a total capacity. And by doing so, I increase this percentage, I'm moving this number closer to the temperature. So that's one way that we can reach saturation. Is just add more moisture to the air, okay? Guess what we got plenty of in Florida? The ocean, Caribbean Sea, Gulf of Mexico, an endless supply of moisture, plenty of warm temperature. So the capacity is there for very, very damaging storms or other types of weather phenomena, okay? A very cold environment, that's fine. I, I have, uh, moisture capacity, once it reaches 100%, then these two are together. That's fine. But what if the temperature were a little warmer and I didn't have any added moisture? What if the temperature were exactly five degrees Celsius instead of minus five? Well, then I don't have 100%. I have some other percentage. What's my other percentage? Not 100 is the right answer, okay? I could care less what it is. We're not gonna calculate it, but I know for a fact that it's not 100. So there are two ways that I could saturate air. I can add more moisture, or I could just decrease the temperature and not change the moisture. If I take this same desert and I decrease the temperature to 10 degrees Celsius, well, now this one is saturated because of the, it's a cooler temperature, all right? A lot of that stuff is gonna come back and, and revisit us as we go through some of these other characteristics, all right? Questions on water content? Not a danger. Things change. So not necessarily is it a danger, remember, I said here, I got 32 degrees Celsius for temperature and 10 degrees for a dew point. It's 26%. How did they come up with that? I don't really care. What I do know is it's not 100 and I'm happy. And then over here, it's 100. I'm still happy, but there are some other considerations. Okay, so there are other things that I need to consider. For instance, here I have what's called visible moisture. There's no visible moisture in this room, right? None. I, I see no other than water bottle, but in the air, no. There's no visible moisture here. I have visible moisture here. I can see it with my eye. Okay? If it's, uh, say, 90%, it's uh, going to uh, separate some soon. Yeah. If it's close, and that's a great point, if it's very, very close, it could have a consideration that maybe it will meet soon, okay? If it's not 100, like I said, I'm happy. If it is 100, there are some other considerations. But what we're talking about now is what if it's just a little bit close? What if it's close and the sun recently went down? It, that temperature may continue to decrease and become fog. So right there at the threshold of this thing becoming 100%, yeah, that could be a little bit of a challenge for us. So that's a great idea, right? Any, anybody else got any questions or comments, concerns on this? Moisture content's a big one. No? Everybody's happy? All right. Okay. Cool, dense air, lifting, warm air, moving over a cool surface, radiation cooling. 
These are three different ways in which visible moisture could become a challenge. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily that it will be a challenge for me for sure. If the temperature and dew point are close, I know that that could result in something soon changing. But ground fog could come from a wide variety of different reasons. The cool, dense air, this is, this is usually a good thing. Cool, dense air moving will typically move any kind of moisture out of the way. If, the, if there's not uh, any moisture or if there's any moisture there that's existing. If I take warm, moist air and move, move it over a cool surface, we could 100% get fog or low clouds. Anybody seen the Golden Gate Bridge? If you read any kind of aviation weather books, it probably had a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge in it. Because what, what's the temperature of that water over there near the Golden Gate Bridge? I'll tell you, it's not the same as it is in Florida. It's very cold, okay? I go there in June and I still won't go swimming in that ocean. It's just way too cold. I know people do it. But if I have warm, moist air moving over that cold water, what do we usually see near the Golden Gate Bridge in the pictures? Lots of fog. That's what you get, right? Okay. That specific type of fog is called advection fog. Okay. Advection. And it requires wind. Remember we said that as air moves up a surface, it also cools? If I have warm, moist air and I move it up a surface, that also forms fog or could form fog, and that's called upslope fog. So, so far I got advection fog, I have upslope fog. Let's talk about another one. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about fog here in a moment. Let's talk about another one, radiation cooling. Oh boy, at least we already know that it's just heat radiating off the surface. All right, heat radiating off the surface. If I have warm, moist air, this could set the stage for radiation fog. Okay, all of the, a lot, a great deal of heat radiates off the Earth's surface and it cools the surrounding air that already has a lot of moisture. So if I take air that is warm and moist and cool it, as soon as it reaches its dew point, visible moisture. And that means that I have, in this case, radiation fog, okay? Now the takeaway here is when those temperatures and dew points get close together, yeah, I got a little bit of a consideration for that. If, I see, if I'm flying to a destination and I see that they, and, and this happens a lot in the winter time in Florida. Like I said, lots of moisture. I'm flying to a destination and we might be in the King Air. We're flying, you know, a, an air charter. I got passengers on board or I'm picking passengers up somewhere. And <clears throat> I notice on the forecast, the weather forecast, that I got temperature 1.5, dew point 1.4. If it's early, early morning and the sun hasn't yet come off the ground, I'm, I'm, calling, I'm calling my boss, I'm calling operations, and I'm letting them know, hey, just, just heads up, because I send my FO a, a, a weather report, a complete weather report before we go on every flight. I send it to them an email an hour, an hour and a half before the flight. And then we talk about it. And I'll call operations and say, hey, look, these people expect us to get in there. It's not an international airport where we go to. That's usually why they hire us because they want to come from home. They want to come from a very small airport and go somewhere else without going to the major airlines. If I notice that temperature and dew point together, I'll call them, hey, might want to just you know, call the client and tell them that there no promises, but we may not be able to, to make the landing for an hour hour and a half. We, we, we might be running a little behind just because we can't get in there. So when the temperature and dew point are close together, especially if I expect that temperature to continue to decrease, consider fog, right? Okay. <clears throat> Low clouds. 
There's four types of clouds in classification by altitude. Four. There's low, middle, high. What in the world do you think the other one would be? Sounds like we already got them right. Low, middle, high. They fit into that category, but they're called clouds with vertical development or extensive vertical development, meaning they're not categorized as low if they are in low and middle cloud criteria or if they're in all three of them or middle and high. So you got low, middle, high, and some sort of combination, clouds with extensive vertical development. Okay, <clears throat> so low clouds are typically below 6,500 feet. So AGL, so somewhere from the surface, it's 6,500 feet. There, there's not a sign out there at 6,500 that says middle clouds start here, right? No, okay, but somewhere around there. Stratus clouds. Stratus is a term, I think it's a Greek term, or I don't know what it is, it's not an English term, and it means sheet-like, right? Just think as a sheet, like you got sheets on the bed. Very thin, stratus clouds, okay? These things are great. They're really cool for making YouTube videos when you're flying a really fast machine, or you're flying a slow machine and you got it on the little time-lapse thing, that's kind of cool too. But anyways, they're kind of nice for making videos when you're flying right over because they're really long like a sheet, okay? Nimbo stratus. I got to talk about this word nimbo because pilots, uh, for a while, and it's not uncommon, pilots will think that means thunderstorms because we hear about this cumulonimbus. Uh, yeah, okay, you got to have rain to have a thunderstorm. You got to have lightning to have thunder, so you have lightning to have a thunderstorm. Okay, that's fine. But it doesn't mean anything about a thunderstorm. Nimbo or nimbus, make that in your head mean rain. So all that means is rain, okay? All right, stratocumulus clouds. So low clouds, but they're a mixture of strato and cumulus. Cumulus is whatever language stratus is, and my apologies for not knowing exactly what that is. I think it's Greek or something. But cumulus just means pillow, right? Thick pillow, puffy. We have a lot of these clouds in, in Florida. It's not common that we have stratus clouds at all. I've been looking out here, I see a lot of stratus clouds. It's kind of nice, right? You'll find a lot of cumulus clouds in Florida. Okay, let's talk about what these things mean. First, we'll go into a little review. What do you think we have here? If you've seen any weather textbooks, you already know. But what do you think we have? It, it's deceiving. I love that. He said the right answer. That is 100% the right answer, saturated air. Okay, what, what kind of saturated air do I got? It's fog, what kind? You know, I would say upslope, just because it's got a bunch of mountain ranges there. Every textbook, and again, I need to, it's the FAA, I think, because it's their picture. I need to write the FAA and tell them, hey guys, I got a better radiation fog picture than you, I guarantee it. And they've had that same picture for, for 30 years, well, since 1974, so 45 years, okay? So that's radiation fog. It looks like valley fog or whatever, there's not such a thing, radiation fog. What happened here is the sun hasn't even come over the mountains yet. You can see I got shadows here. The, the surface is still radiating the heat from the previous day. And I have moist air down here in this valley. Why is it moist air? I mean, just because it's moist. It must be a lake or an ocean or a sea somewhere near this thing, okay? That fed moisture into that air. Lots of moisture content. Here I have radiation fog, okay? All right. What kind of fog do I have here? I haven't talked about it yet. What do you think? Those of you that are reading the books. What? Who? Mist? Oh, I, okay. I heard it. ST. It's steam fog. It's mist. Yeah, I get it. Mist has a specific uh, uh, place in this section. Uh, it's not here. That's steam fog. 
And steam fog is a result of a warm body of water and very, very cold air. And steam fog will contain two common hazards. And those two common hazards are icing and low-level turbulence or low-level wind shear. Okay? It'll be very bumpy and a very uh, uh, hard ride, very uncomfortable ride here. And probably a lot of icing near steam fog. All right. All right. So the idea is these are all still somewhere classified as low clouds. Because just because it's fog, that doesn't mean it's not a cloud. It's a cloud that's sitting on the earth. So somewhere between the surface and 6,500, that's still got a low cloud. All right. <clears throat> Middle clouds. God bless them. They, they, give, they give me another different language here to work with. Alto. I think this is Latin or something. I don't know. I've been saying it for a long time. I should figure out where it comes from. That just means middle. Alto stratus, 6,500 AGL to 20,000 MSL. So we're around that range. Okay. 20,000 is already into the flight levels. Okay. Class alpha airspace. This is middle clouds. Alto clouds. Alto stratus. Stratus, what kind of cloud is that? Very thin. Would I expect there to be a nice smooth ride? Yeah, man, I got my, Go, my GoPro sitting on the dash, right? Very smooth ride, very nice. Hey, that's a ride you want to brag about. Take a video, send that one home, you know? Alto cumulus cloud, same layer. 6,500 AGL, 20,000 MSL. But what do I think my ride is like here? Cumulus, bumpy, even on the outside of it. How about above it? Where did Howard Hughes take his constellations? Above the clouds, right? Because a smooth ride for the passengers. So above the clouds, you, and above, I mean, thousand feet or so, not really like right above. Right above, you're gonna get bumped around on this thing pretty good. But, you know, a thousand feet away from it, which is how far I need to stay away anyways. For class, uh, well, class alpha, I can't be VFR. But if I'm flying somewhere in echo airspace, I need to be at least 1,000 feet above that cloud VFR. Okay, high clouds. Fantastic. Cirrus. <laughs> I think those people in Duluth just used that word because it was a cloud and it was kind of a cool cloud, right? Wispy clouds. Very, very thin. Now, this by all means at all does not indicate that I might have a nice smooth ride there. These clouds, because we've said that middle clouds were from 6,500 to 20,000, where are the high clouds at? What class, alpha, what class airspace am I in if I, if I find a high cloud? It guaranteed I'm in alpha airspace, okay? All right, so rules change there a little bit. And like I said, this gets to the point where we're not gonna talk about it very much. But I have no idea what the ride condition could be there. Okay, I've flown here before where nice smooth day, and then all of a sudden, holy smokes, I hope everybody had their seat belts on for that, okay? So I don't know, clear air turbulence could occur, or it could be wake, wake turbulence, you know, uh, wingtip vortices or whatever the case may be, all right? Zero stratus clouds, zero stratus just, very high cloud, everything is zero stratus. Again, very sheet-like. I would expect the ride to be smooth, but again, yeah, we're getting to a point where it becomes unpredictable. Zero cumulus clouds, I, I really don't expect this to be a nice ride at all, okay? It, it probably won't be, and then outside those clouds, it might not be, just because it's cumulus. All right, and ta-da, clouds with vertical development. Cumulus, towering cumulus, cumulonimbus. Hmm. Each one of those clouds, what do they got in common? Cumulus clouds. Clouds with vertical development. What makes me associate these two things? Why would I associate cumulus? There's not a stratus up here. Right? I, there's not a zero cirrus, there's none of that, nothing. There's bad cumulus, worse cumulus, and even worse cumulus, right? So what's going on? 
So remember, we're building our toolkit today, right? You got the electrician that comes out and he's gonna, he's gonna work on something here or she, they're gonna work on something, right? What'd they come with? They came with their lineman pliers, they came with their tester, they came with a screwdriver. They, they got all these tools in their tool belt, right? You guys got tools in your tool belt right now. You got some tools in your tool belt right now that could lead you to a good estimation of why these two things are associated. Okay. What's the ride like in that cumulus cloud? By the way, it's okay. I, I, I'm encouraging you to just focus for a minute. Okay. It's okay that nobody is spitting out the answers. In fact, that's probably better. Okay. But think about this for a minute. What's that ride like in that cumulus cloud? Yeah. Bumpy. Why did it get that way? Because of what? Moving air. Okay. And pressure. Okay. I got it. Convection. Everybody hear convection? Conve and, and moisture. Okay, 100% I got saturated air here. What's my relative humidity and all this stuff? Just teaser. Yeah, 100%. Okay, that's fine. But convection, something is causing this air, this saturated air, to move up. Okay? Now, earlier, that tool that we got in our tool belt, it's in there. You have to reach for it. Oh, found a screwdriver. Hurt my finger, right? All right, so here's what you got. I know for a fact that as air rises, it cools at that dry adiabatic lapse rate. None of this air is dry. It's all moist. Well, it still cools. It's just the moist adiabatic lapse rate is two to, uh, I think it's one and a half degrees Fahrenheit per uh, Correction, one and a half degrees Celsius per thousand feet. So it still cools. And as it cools, it continues to expand. It's unstable. We talked stability for a minute and I told you that was gonna be our key point. That was gonna be something that we really need to hold on to. So here it is. The air inside these clouds is moving upwards. Now, during a cumulus stage, during a cumulus cloud formation, it's moving upwards and sometimes moving upwards very, very rapidly. There's very little downward movement, but the air is moving upwards and it's very, very bumpy. That's why it's not categorized as a high cloud. It's not categorized as a middle or a low cloud. This thing is moving and taking shape. It's becoming something else. Okay. That something else could very possibly be a thunderstorm. All right. Okay. So yeah, again, little tools, we're starting to clean them off. They're sharp now. We're good. All right. Uh, let me look at the monitor and see. Okay, you guys can't see that at all up there. This is a cloud, and that's <laughs> fine. This is the Earth's surface. Okay. No, normally, these are on uh, uh, a monitor at the school because we got you know some some monitors that are everywhere. Of course, a size a class this size, I probably wouldn't be very good with my monitor. But uh, apologies for this. This is a, a, a cloud here. And, and rain just beginning to fall out of that cloud. I said what that was during key terms. Anybody remember? It has a crazy name, five letters. Virga? Yeah, Virga. Okay. Important? Yeah, it's kind of a teaser. That's why it's not a big deal that this thing didn't come together. But all right. Anyways, that slide is terrible. I'll remember that for any projectors I do from now on. I wonder if I turn the lights off, it would be better probably. But rain that does not fall all the way to the surface, that's called Virga, all right? Don't become an expert on Virga. Don't go home tonight and dedicate four weeks on your life doing a research project on Virga, okay? I'll, I'll change the slide. Okay, we see these wispy clouds like this right here. You see a mountain range right there. Some of this, uh, some of these weather patterns are gonna create hazardous weather just because, and we have an entire section on weather hazards. Uh, some of these wind patterns are gonna cause hazards just because they're blown across some topography or some sort of a mountain or some sort of a terrain feature. Now here, 
And as I promised on those high clouds, I know that I could have clear air turbulence anywhere. Here, for mountain flying, lucky thing about Florida, there's no mountains. But again, we're not going to spend a research project on this. For mountain flying, I could have very dangerous weather on the leeward side of that mountain. Just because of the way the wind moves over it and what occurs on the back side of that mountain as it moves across. Okay. Now, depending on where I am, and we're gonna spend more time talking about a training environment more than anything else. Remember on day one, we said pilots should reach out and get additional training if they wanted to do certain things like fly high performance airplanes. Well, you need an endorsement for that, complex, whatever. But also if you were planning to fly at night and you hadn't flown at night, right? Or if you were trying to fly in mountains and you hadn't flown in mountains, these are your specialized programs. But some of these things, I should expect to have a norm, these are called source regions. I should expect to have the same type of weather conditions along certain parts of the United States. It makes the, the weather predicting kind of easy, okay? It makes our jobs as aviators very nice. Guess what I do if I know that I have a, a, a flight the next morning, I'm gonna be teaching at the flight school because I'm not always teaching at the flight school, I'm doing the air charter too. But if I know I have three students at the flight school tomorrow, guess what I'm doing in the morning when I wake up? Man, I'm waking up, I'm singing, I'm getting ready to drive to the airport, man, you know what I mean? Am I looking at the weather thinking about canceling? No, not a chance in the world. You know why? Because I know I don't have to. The, the worst thing that I could possibly do is have to talk to somebody and tell them jokes for 20 minutes while the rain shower passes, right? And they got to struggle and sit there and listen to my jokes. But I know that I'm going to be able to fly that day. Why? Well, because I have maritime, tropical, warm, moist air constantly moving in from the Caribbean Sea. All right. I get a little bit from the Gulf of Mexico over here, but I know I have nice, warm, moist air. And any type of weather phenomena that's going to occur in the central part of the United States is typically stopped before it gets to me. Okay, so these source regions help me develop some habits, help me develop some patterns of, yeah, th this is the weather I expect to see and it's not going to change that much. Okay, well, unless a hurricane comes blasting through the Atlantic Ocean, now I got a couple of days I got to, you know, uh, board up my windows and leave somewhere else, right? Go to the Key West. That's what I did last year. I went to Key West. But anyways, so I should know based on these source regions what my conditions are. All right. <clears throat> this is an example of what happens when here I got one of these source regions moving across the United States, moving across some other area. As this air mass moves across and uh, begins to exhibit the similar characteristics of the other regions. Now that says CP air. What in the world is that? Well, I got continental polar, right? All these crazy people living in Canada. <laughs> they got all this cold air. It never comes over to me. But believe me, all this area here is worse crazy, I think, than up there. But whatever, that's fine. It's not going to come down to me here. Let's use it as an example because that's what Jepson did. You know, I got this polar air coming across from Canada, moves over the Great Lakes. What do the Great Lakes have plenty of? Moisture content. So what do I expect? Saturated air. Saturated air, in this case, in the form of clouds. Could be, that's fine. If, if the conditions were set for that air to freeze and for that moisture to freeze, I could get what's called lake effect snow. You guys get any of that here, lake effect snow? Which, which part of Russia gets the worst lake effect snow? Do you guys know what I mean by that? I could only imagine, yeah. St. Petersburg, right? Okay. Well, we get that in, in the Northeast region. And has anyone heard of, I don't live up there, so I don't know. Anyone heard of, uh, uh, nor'easter. That's what they call it in, you have to Google search this. It's in, uh, uh, New York, Philadelphia, Boston, all that new England area, a nor'easter. 
Does that sound familiar? I could be getting it wrong. You know why? Because I, I live where it's warm. I don't live where it's that cold. So this nor'easter is when the, the winds blow. It's either nor'easter or nor'wester. I can't remember which one it is. But I think it's a nor'easter. It's when the winds blow from the northeast over Maine, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Vermont, uh, uh, New York, and all those other areas. And it moves plenty of moist, cold snow and a storm from the Atlantic Ocean. And they get, they get hundreds of inches of snow when these things come through. Same type of thing is happening here. In that example, what's happening, you have a source region. It has, it's filled with all sorts of uh, hazards and all sorts of yucky weather. And it's moving across the United States and dissipating all of that ugliness, okay? Well, this is what we have. Warm, moist air blowing on you all day long while you're flying the airplanes, okay? You'll get a thunderstorm in the summertime every day, but again, tell jokes for 20 minutes and it's over with. So this idea behind source regions and also behind air masses. It's important that we know about these air masses and spend some time talking about them. Whether it's cold weather, whether it's warm weather, it doesn't matter. When these two things begin to interact, when these two things start to affect each other, you get some potentially violent weather. You get some weather changes for sure. And you get one weather change in particular that's going to happen each and every single time that another air mass moves through. And you guys can see the size of this air mass, right? From Canada over Michigan and going into the Appalachian Mountains. So air masses are large regions. This is not me over a beach somewhere, and that's, that's not an air mass. An air mass is a very, very large, large region of air. Okay, <clears throat> warm, moist air coming from the Pacific Ocean. I don't know how in the world they consider this warm, because even all the way down in San Diego, it's still kind of chilly, but that happens. You get widespread stratus or fog. The entire state of California, in this case, is affected by that air mass. And this is a very small example of an air mass. The air masses that affect us in the, in the winter time come from this continental polar. They come from Canada, they come from Alaska, certainly by the time it gets to us, it's only 45 degrees Fahrenheit, so not too terribly, but it's a cold day for us. These air masses, when they move, they can affect a large geographical region. Okay, uh, by the way, if you're going to take your written exam, and everybody's going to take your written exam, right? Some of the questions are going to make you know the states in the United States. It's, who here knows all 50 states in the United States, where it is? You can point to it on the map now, right? No. I probably couldn't either. I know a lot of them. Don't lose any sleep over it. It's only a couple of questions. But I, every now and then I get a pilot that's in there and they're like, oh, how do I know where Utah is? And I'm like, well, guess. <laughs> Just take a wild guess. That's all you can do for that question. All right. All right. So because on, that, on the uh, test, it won't tell you where the states are. It'll tell you, show you a big map and expect you to know where it is. All right. No big deal. When the air masses come, to, uh, come against each other, we have what's called a front. Here you have typical cold front weather. And that typical cold front weather is underneath a side view of a cold front. Okay? Well, no surprise, we're going to look at a warm front. So wait, there's a lot more detail on this. Okay? Everything that we've talked about so far it is going to come together right here. All right. So the cold front. Comparing mass between a cold air and a warm air mass, right? Comparing weight of these two, which one of these weigh more cold or warm air? Okay. So before we go too much further in this, let's just look at the top of the screen. Do you see the cold front, how it's shaped just like this? 
This is a very, very aggressive weather phenomenon. Okay? It's moving in this direction, left to right, and it typically moves very, very fast. Because if I have a bulldozer pushing a moped out of the way, well, the bulldozer is not going to slow down at all, right? Just won't do it. So consider that the bulldozer. It's pushing the warm air out of the way. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Get out of the way, right? Okay. Warm air, if warm air is moving against a cold air mass, it's perhaps stationary, right? If warm air is moving, there's still force equals mass times acceleration. Newton's second law still holds true. But now it's this case, I got the moped trying to push the bulldozer. And hopefully the bulldozer's in neutral. Okay? So yeah, this thing is going to move very, very slow because it has less mass. It weighs less. All right, knowing that, let's get into this thing and figure out what's going on with them. So <clears throat> we're gonna consider a couple of columns prior to passage, during the passage, and after the passage. This is not reflected here at all. This is just a reflection of what do I have as far as the side view of a cold front and what's going on with that warm, unstable air on the other side. Okay. Real quick, which one of these, which one of these air masses have more moisture content? The warmer one. Remember. So your moisture content is here. Okay. Clouds. Prior to passage, what do we have? So I was over here. The cold front hasn't reached me yet. Prior to passage, I got seroform. Uh, towering cumulus and or cumulonimbus. It's already starting to get a little bad because all that warm, moist air is forced upwards. When warm, moist air is forced upwards, it cools. And if it saturates, now I have a whole nother different set of problems, right? Continues to develop those cumulus clouds. This is a lifting force, okay? So prior to passage, precipitation, showery. Ugh, I like it, but I don't like the fact that we haven't talked about what's the opposite of showery. You just think about the shower being on. Okay, that's fine. Well, showery means that it might be raining here, right over this building, but I look across the street and it's not raining there. Okay, that will happen in Florida quite a bit. We get to see this stuff. It's beautiful. The sun is out where I'm standing and across the airport, it's pouring down rain. Like you can't even see the building over there. That's showery precipitation, okay? Usually it doesn't last very long, okay? But when it does, very large water droplets, very heavy concentrated rain, visibility inside that goes almost to nothing, okay? So let's take a look. Visibility, fair and haze. All right, that's fine. It's fair and haze, right? Wind, it starts off as an example in a direction. I understand this says south, southwest. Just think about that being a direction, okay? What's the temperature like? Well, I have warm air, so it's warm. Dew point is high, okay? Very high relative humidity. Pressure, falling rapidly. Why is it falling? Well, because all of the air is moving up. This is just like your vacuum cleaner, right? All the air is being sucked away out of there. All right, during passage, now I'm right here. Towering cumulus and or cumulonimbus, that's fine. So seriform has gone away, but I got towering cumulus and or cumulonimbus. Heavy showers, possible hail, lightning, and thunder. Visibility is poor. Okay. Uh, poor, but only inside that rain shower. Okay. Remember, I just now talked about my example of me being this side of the, the airport and it was beautiful. It was sunny. I could see forever across the airport. It was a disaster mess, right? There was a bunch of rain. You can't see anything. 
So yes, the visibility is poor, but only inside that rain phenomena. Okay. Wind variable and gusty. So yeah, the wind's all over the place. Do I have a certain direction? No, it's just not that anymore. It's variable and gusty. Temperature, suddenly cooler. Well, yeah, cold front came through. Dew point is rapidly dropping. Dry air. And pressure bottoms out, then rises rapidly. Okay. After passage, what do I have? Cumulus clouds. This is okay. The, the storm has gone away and most of the rain has gone away. But remember... Here I had rapidly dropping on my dew point. Let's see how that plays out. What happens with my precipitation? Slowly decreasing showers. These showers are going away. They're following the front of that cold front. They're gonna move in that direction. Visibility is good. I expect the visibility to be good. The, uh, the conditions are unstable. I know that because I had those cumulus clouds. Those are unstable conditions. But the visibility is good. Where's the wind? A direction different than where it was before. Every time any front passes, the wind will be different from where it was before the front passed. Okay, that's the one phenomenon that you guarantee as a front crosses through, the wind is gonna be different, okay? Yeah. Not opposite, different. It'll be in a different direction. Not really. Because um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the upper atmosphere that we're not seeing here. So this got here because of some sort of movement. And it doesn't move equally from the surface all the way up to the flight levels. And depending on what's going on up there, it could change things a lot. Okay. Look at what temperature. Continued cooler. Great cold front. Dew point, continued drop, less moisture. This is dry air, good visibility, okay. And the pressure rises rapidly. All right, warm front. Prior to, we're gonna go right through it. Clouds, seroform, stratiform, fog, okay. Possible cumulonimbus in the summer. Now, fog, we mentioned that Fog might be there as a result of a temperature inversion, correct? Fog would mean that I have maybe a... And I want to also associate a temperature inversion with stable conditions, not unstable condition. What's the difference? Unstable, air is moving up and down rapidly, right? It's making a cumulus cloud. Stable conditions, that's my nice flat sheet-like stratus cloud. So if I can start associating fog, temperature dew point, temperature inversion, and stable conditions, I'm almost there, okay? Just one more time, one more glance around this, this little object. Why would I have a temperature inversion at, ahead of this warm front? Well, what's the definition of temperature inversion? As I climb, so as I get in my airplane and I climb, I experience a decrease in temperature normally, but now today I got an increase in temperature. That's weird. Well, look, I'm here. What are the conditions here? Cold, dry. All right, I start climbing. You got to whistle while you do it. Where am I now? I'm in warmer air. So fog, temperature inversion, stable conditions. All right, gears are turned. Are, these are real characteristics here, okay? All right, precipitation, light to moderate rain, drizzle, sleet, or snow. Drizzle. You guys know what drizzle's like, right? Didn't it drizzle a little bit today? It did on me, right? Real, real small little raindrops. It's doing it here. It's doing it across the street. It's doing it in the next city over, right? It was doing it yesterday. It's doing it today. This is continuous precipitation. Just steady 
continuous, small, nagging precipitation. All right? Visibility is poor. Well, fog, okay? Visibility is poor. I have a smooth ride, very smooth ride. I can't see nothing. Okay. Not good for the visual guy, right? But nice smooth ride. Look at the wind. All right, let, let's not, let's go ahead and break the ice on this one. Let's not, what happens? Front passes, wind changes. I don't know by how much or which direction. Now, we could formulate some opinions, but honestly, as an aviator, I could care less. I just know when that front passes, boom, the wind changes direction, okay? Dew point, rising steadily, meaning there's more and more moisture. Oh yeah, fog, that makes sense. Poor visibility. I mean, all this stuff is starting to, like I said, this is where it's all gonna capture and all come together. The pressure is falling, okay? All right, that's fine, as this thing is, is approaching. Okay, during passage, I got stratiform clouds. Fine, again, stratus. What, what, what were those clouds like? Sheet-like and flat and smooth. Very, very steady. A nice, easy, smooth ride, okay? Precipitation, drizzle, if any, but still drizzle. Visibility, poor, improving, but it's poor. Wind variable, we got that. Temperature rising steadily, uh, dew point steady, and becoming steady for the, for the pressure. Now, after the passage, stratocumulus, possible cumulonimbus, you know, this is where your warm front, I got warm, moist air, and as it comes through and starts really blending in with that cold air, things begin to reach their dew point, and, and, and this could turn into something that's slightly unstable. All right, I, no real cumulonimbus here, nothing terribly dangerous, but it, it could become bumpy and, and, and aggravating. Rain or showers, if any, uh, visibility is fair and haze, still kind of hazy. The, temp or the, the wind change, dew port warming, uh, rising then steady and then slight rise and then falling on my pressure. I want you guys to start associating a couple of things here now. Look at the cold front and consider this cold front unstable air. I see this coming during the entire passage process. I will have unstable conditions. Now on the other side of it, once I get over here, it'll be colder outside, but it'll probably be better than it was before. During that front passage, you have unstable conditions. Okay. I can see for a long ways if I'm not flying in the rain showers. Are any of us allowed to fly in rain showers? Nope. So I can see a long ways, but the ride is terrible. Very, very bumpy. Not a good day to fly if I'm getting air sick or if I'm taking somebody for a ride and they get air sick, okay? We're gonna have to clean up the airplane. Start, start associating this with stable conditions because that's what you have here. These are stable conditions, all right? I can't see very much if any. So if I can't see anything, well, we have no reason to fly. As long as I got three statute miles visibility and controlled airspace, I can fly. If I'm in uncontrolled airspace, then well, I can fly down to one statute mile visibility. Might wanna run it through a risk management matrix and make sure, right? Maybe not a smart idea. You can do it, nobody's gonna say you can, but not a great idea. But again, I can't see very much, but gosh, what a smooth ride. A very smooth ride. As long as I'm flying outside of any of that mist or fog or anything else, this is a really nice day to fly. Now, a lot of my, and this is fun because actually when Andre uh, first came over for about five, maybe six years, every single winter, I would have two dozen students. And some of them were students that wanted to earn their instrument ratings. Some of them were pilots that were already instrument rated, commercial rated, ATP, all sorts of things. I had at least two dozen pilots a year fly with me during late December to somewhere mid-February, end of February, March, just to do the instrument flight training there in South Florida. Because the, the ceiling was almost nothing. 
The visibility was terrible. We would have to go on a missed approach. I'd do it on an instrument flight plan, of course, and we'd have a great time doing that. And you could actually practice in real conditions all the way down to minimums. And I'm the flight instructor. I don't know if we're gonna go missed or not. We gotta get down there and you gotta make a decision. And people were coming from all over the place to do that. Well, Florida fixed me. They canceled that approach that I used to make those two. They actually, they canceled both of the approaches. They, they removed them from the database. I, have, I seriously doubt it had to do anything with me, but we were keeping those unpopulated areas very, very, very busy on a daily basis. And that was kind of fun. But again, the ride was so beautiful. It was smooth. You couldn't see anything at all outside the window. Right? We had five hours of fuel. We're going to get on the ground somewhere. I can promise you we're not going to crash. Okay. But it was a really, really nice ride. So when, on those days, those, those days where you have uh, a warm front come through, when you have stable conditions, very smooth, no visibility, very little. Okay. Okay. Couple of different things. Now we're not, We've got some information and we got some tools already in our tool belt about different fronts. A cold front occlusion and a warm front occlusion. We can go through it, I'm fine. You guys are probably tired of hearing me talk about this. These do occur, they are a real thing and they produce some of the most severe weather phenomena that you'll experience, okay? But the theory behind this and putting everything together is, is complicated and it also has a lot to do with those upper level winds. So let's get the idea. The idea is I either have already a cold front and it's moving, it's a slow moving cold front, which usually those are the, the most damaging, a very slow moving cold front and then behind that slow moving cold front, I got a rapidly approaching warm front. Well, the warm front is not gonna move the cold front out of the way, but it is gonna begin to ride over it. It is gonna mix there on the boundary. It is gonna add a lot more moisture to the problem, which is just one of the last things you need recipe for disaster in a thunderstorm, okay? And it's gonna just slowly push a little bit on that cold front and make it increase speed. So just give all the ingredients that we need for terrible weather and then make a, a, a slow moving cold front move just a little bit faster so that it forces the air up in the, in, uh, into the atmosphere quicker, okay? That is the cold front occlusion, okay? It means that there was a front that existed already and another front occluded with it. I don't even know what the word occluded means. It just sounds like a neat word to me. But essentially, this is a front that's happening already and another one comes over it. The warm front occlusion, I get the same thing, but now I got a warm front that's interacting with cold air and I got a cold front now coming back on top of those things. Again, these are, these are hazardous weather conditions. They are real. We see them every now and then. I saw one uh, about two and a half weeks ago, and I was in a training program with a bunch of pilots in, a, in the King Air, actually, and uh, I had three or four pilots, all ATPs and all that. And we put up the low, uh, the surface prognosis chart for the United States. And I showed them, I said, hey, guys, take a look. Next three days, we're going to have some pretty bad weather and there were tornadoes in Tampa on that third day because there were occluded fronts coming all the way across from Maine all the way down to the Yucatan Peninsula. All right, down to Mexico. And, and I told them that that was going to, and sure enough, we had a canceled flight in Tampa and th that third day. So typical occluded front weather, seriform, stratiform, that's fine, becomes stratus possibly towering cumulus and or cumulonimbus and then nimbostratus or altostratus. A lot of nimbo in there. What's nimbo mean? Rain. Rain. That's all it means. Precipitation, light to heavy, light to heavy, light to moderate, and then clearing. So hazardous weather. Visibility, poor, poor, improving. <laughs> right? 
This is always either raining or always foggy. Wind does what? Every time the front passes. Changes. Temperature. Cold to cool. Cold. Rising, falling, all that other good stuff. Pressure and temperature and dew point and all that.